Did you know that Piplup has a crown in its design because its whole line is royal? Or that there exist beavers without beaver tails and that's Bidoof? Or that Luminion exists? Or perhaps that Arceus is a conglomeration of creator deities from all around the world and the llama? That's not a joke. These are the kinds of things we dig into on this channel, and now that Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl just smashed its way onto the market, and it has a load of Gen 4 Pokemon, for some reason, we're going to celebrate by explaining the origins of every Gen 4 Pokemon. Let's get into it. Now, I should say, this video very quickly goes over the inspirations of the Pokémon, but this channel is all about that, so we have loads of videos that dive way deeper into specific Pokémon lines that you should check out too. I might spend 30 seconds to a minute on a Pokémon line here, while in actuality they have 10 to 15 minutes worth of origins and thus have a video of their own somewhere on this channel. So please, if you like what you see here, subscribe and check out my channel page. Now then, we start with the starters, because how could you not? Turtwig is a little turtle! Most similar to the Asian box turtle. Turtles do occasionally have plant life growing on their shells. Due to them being slow and having those shells, which are a nice flat surface that they can't really reach up to to clean, it's a symbiotic relationship. The plant gets a ride and the turtle gets better camouflage? I guess. Well, in the case of the Pokemon, the Dex mentions that they share energy with photosynthesis. Grottle too has a bit of a snapping turtle face, but its body more closely resembles a generic dinosaur, like Spike from the Land Before Time. It seems to have the armor of a young Ankylosaurus and the spike plates of a stegosaurus, except they are bushes instead of spike plates. I suppose bushes are themselves an upgrade from a twig. Also, fun fact, it's an oak bush. We know this because in the anime there's a grottle and it has acorns in its bush. And the upgrade of a bush is clearly a tree, which we get with Torterra, a tortoise with terrain on its back, hence its new ground typing. It seems to pull its broadened shell from the Proganochelis, and its spikes from the Maolania, two extinct turtles, and may in concept be inspired by the world turtle, the idea that the entire world is on the back of several celestial elephants who themselves are on the back of a massive space turtle, a turtle covered in terrain, in a way. It comes from many different ancient cultures, and the Pokedex even mentions ancient people imagined that beneath the ground a gigantic Torterra dwelled, which similarly was referenced in Detective Pikachu. Chimchar, Monferno, and Infernape are always monkeying around. Have I used that joke before? I'm sure I have. It's hard to keep track. Anyways, these simians are based off of Sun Wukong from the very popular myth, Journey to the West. They are fire type because Infernape shares many similarities to Hanuman, which is thought to be an inspiration for Sun Wukong from the Hindu epic Ramayana, wherein Hanuman, who is a Kanara, a race of monkey people, was granted immunity to fire and thus can use it safely. Also, before we get any deeper into the video, I'm trying with these pronunciations and I'm so sorry. As for animals, Chimchar appears tailless and is thus most similar to a chimpanzee. And according to the Pokedex, the gas made in its belly burns from its rear end. Yeah, it's like a gas-powered stove, except it, it, the ape is burning its own farts. It gains the fighting type when it evolves into Monferno, likely a reference not only to Sun Wukong, who is clearly the inspiration to Infernape's whole design, but also to monkey-style kung fu. And Monferno's face seems to be a cross of a mandrill and a golden snub-nosed monkey. Piplup is probably my favorite starter, just period, full stop. In its line are all penguins. Piplup itself is a sort of generic baby penguin. Primplup is a crested penguin, and Empoleon, what else but an emperor penguin, it's in the name. Empoleon, emperor, Primplup, prince. Royalty is referenced in the whole line, and the Pokedex mentions how prideful they are. Plus, Prip and Primplup have these spots resembling large buttons on the clothes of nobles, and the back flaps they have resemble the backs of long tuxedos. People always connect penguins to tuxedos, it's such an easy connection to make. But also, did you notice that the light blue patch above Pip and Primplup's beaks resembles a little crown? Then, as in Empoleon, the beak itself becomes a large crown, and one resembling a trident at that, the weapon of choice of Poseidon, the Greek god who rules over the seas. Its white belly resembles fancy ruffles or doilies, and it's got a big collar, for it is the emperor. Perhaps even a direct reference to Emperor Napoleon.
Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of France, hence the name Empoleon. Napoleon. Emperor Napoleon. Empo yeah. And lastly, its new steel type, rather than ice, is a reference to icebreaker ships. Its middle is even shaped like the tips of some of them. It slices through icebergs with ease with its blades of steel. Ah, and we finally get to a simple one. The Starly line. Starly, Staravia, and Staraptor. They are all starlings, like the white-cheeked starling and the gray starling, both very common birds across Asia. Being starlings, you can see some star shapes in their designs. Though unlike starlings, they have these stylish tufts of feathers on their heads, which more so resemble quail and the northern lapwing. And finally, Staraptor adds in raptor elements, birds of prey, like the long-crested and harpy eagles, the red here likely referencing the sharp, bloody nature of raptors, or just over one eye emo haircuts that were popular at the time that the first games were out. Ah, oh, it's Bidoof, our golden god. It's what you get when you cross a doofus with a mountain beaver. Mountain beavers are basically the beavers you already know, but they lack the iconic beaver tail that beavers are famous for. But that's what the barrel gets, and that's also why it gains the water type. Beavers use those big tails to help them swim. Also, since beavers are known for eating wood, Bib Barrel has a bib design on its chest. Cricketot and Deedle Deedle Eat Whoop. They seem to combine leaf beetles with crickets, who are famous for playing their music incredibly loudly all night long. There may even be elements of the violin beetle in Cricketoon, or at the very least an actual violin or cello, as it plays its music similar to how a human would play one of those. And also it has a pattern resembling one on its body. And I love its little maestro mustache! Cricketot similarly has a body resembling the strings of violins, and according to the Pokedex, when its antenna hit each other, it sounds like the music of a xylophone. Jinx, Luxio, and Luxray. I see fans saying that they are lions all the time, and they do have some lion traits, I suppose. More so sphinxes, mythological lion people, but their names, abilities, and the region they are found in all tell us that they are lynx. Wild kitties of the cold north. They similarly have manes, but also black tips on their ears. And according to both Greek and Norse mythology, lynx are the keeper of secrets and have supernatural eyesight, able to see straight through solid objects. Luxray does have X-ray in its name, and the Pokedex says Luxray's ability to see through objects comes in handy when it's scouting for danger. So perfect! And lastly, the little stars on the ends of their tails, which also are much longer than lynx Lynx tails typically are, are probably a reference to the Lynx constellation itself, which similarly is depicted as a Lynx, but with a significantly longer tail than real Lynx typically have. But do! It's a Rosebud, also a baby Pokemon, which all have something baby-esque about them. In this case, it has a little bib, and the little baby with hair pulled straight up hairstyle, more common in babies than adults. Roserade itself carries two bouquets of roses, while its head is also a large white rose. Its mask, cape, and demeanor all resemble the stereotypical attendee of a masquerade ball, fancy parties where identities are hidden. This may play a role in its poison type too, as roses aren't poisonous, but the Hellebore plant is. And while noticeably different if you know how to look out for it, at a glance, they are often confused for roses. And then, the Gen 4 fossil Pokémon. Solid attack and solid defense. Both are dinosaurs, and also both have castle elements. I mean, just look at Bastiodon's face! Those dots not only resemble the patterns on various ceratopsians, but also they are the windows in a castle wall. And look up here, the tops of castle towers. It's a bastion, Bastiodon, you know. It most closely resembles the Chasmosaurus, crossed with a bulldozer with excavator teeth, especially with its shiny color. Its bone piece here resembles many depictions of cavemen with nose rings made of bone. Its Prevo, Shieldion, has a medieval shield for a face, and most closely resembles a Protoceratops, a much, much smaller common ancestor to all ceratops. Rampartos pulls from the offensive part of a castle, the ramparts, where archers and siege weapons would stand to attack. And similarly, it's a battering ram, what's used to attack castle gates, ramming them open. It fits right in with the scientifically inaccurate but still popular idea that Pachycephalosaurus would ram their heads together like this when battling one another. And due to its spikes, it appears to pull more so from the Draco Rex, while Cranidos, with its big cranio and small body, likely 
samples from the Micropachycephalosaurus. Now, I should definitely note, we go into way more detail with these four Pokemon in this video right here. I highly recommend it. For now, though, we're moving on to Burmy and Wormadam, also nothing. They are pretty simple. They are based on bag worms, worms that create small protective cases for themselves out of materials in their surroundings. Most commonly, sticks, leaves, small rocks, microplastics. Hence the three different types of Burmy and Wormadam. This species has some pretty drastic sexual dimorphism. The females will stay in a larvae-like state, hence female Burmy evolving into Wormadam, a madam. And the males will fully metamorphize into moths, hence moth him. And as a female, Wormadam has accessories that resemble hair and little lines resembling eyelashes. And as a male, moth him is allowed to leave the house. When it does, it steals honey collected by Combi, which is a similar behavior to some other moths. Also, he's got a big nose, which bagworm moths, known as case moths, don't have. But moths in the Pyroloidae family do. But speaking of combi, it's pretty clear to see that it's a honeybee, but like the actual honeycomb itself from the hive sprouted wings. Only female combi are capable of evolving into Vespiquen, clearly a queen bee. Its very thin waist and regal dress pulls from the shape and design of paper wasp nests, and her head resembles various noble women's headwear from the Middle Ages, such as escoffions, calls, and hooded crowns. Pachiritsu! It's Gen 4's Pikachu clone, and it's quite simply a cute squirrel with electric pouch cheeks, the spikes on its tail possibly reflecting the effect that static electricity has on hair, making it go all up and spiky all over. Weasel and Floatzel are both mustelids, the family of mammals that both weasels and otters are found in. And like an otter, they are very buoyant, and float like a buoy, or even a little floaty. They both have life jacket-like pool ring flotation devices on them, and fins that help them swim better. Weasel itself is so buoyant that it can spin its two tails to fly, just like Tails from Sonic the Hedgehog, who is also orange with two tails. It has to be a direct reference. The Pokedex also mentions that they both use the double tails to corkscrew in the water and swim way fast. Mechanically though, it makes no sense. That's not how bodies work. That's some cartoon logic baloney in my pseudo-realistic JRPG. Now, I'm so glad that Pokemon 420 is Cherubi for no reason at all. Cherubi is a cherry. Japan is famous for their cherry trees and cherry blossoms. Hence, Cherim also having its sunshine form, which also has the proper amount of petals. When the sun comes out, it blooms, and there are actually quite a number of photonastic flowers. Flowers that open and close based on if there is currently sunlight or not. Though strangely, its overcast form doesn't quite resemble cherry blossoms whatsoever. It's more like a fuchsia flower, which are also famous across Japan, so at least there's that connection. I really do think it's cute though. It looks so cozy in there. There's no greater feeling than when it's raining outside and I'm all wrapped up in a cozy blanket while atop a super comfortable mattress provided by today's sponsor Helix Sleep. I love sleep and being comfortable. And leaving the house, uh, that's some discomfort right there, which is where Helix Sleep comes in. New mattresses delivered to your door. No more awkwardly laying down in front of the strangers at the mattress store. Comfy. It's a Christmas miracle all year round. They've got a sleep quiz that will help determine which mattress is right for you or even you and someone else. <laughs> My wife and I have been using ours for like three years now, and so has Josh, an editor who lives with us. And so so do my other housemates, and some of my previous housemates. They've sent me a lot of mattresses, and all of us love them. Excellent upgrades, and just in case we didn't love them, that's no problem. Helix Sleep lets you try it out for a whole 100 days, and if you aren't fully satisfied, they will not only give you a full refund, but even deal with picking up the mattress for you. It's worry-free. Personally, I really like the medium-feeling, pillow-topped Midnight Lux. It's held up to its age beautifully, and it still has like seven years on its warranty. Yeah, a 10-year warranty. That's like half my life. That's like a third of my life. And while the world rulers sleep on whether people deserve adequate money for their labor, we've got to use as many sweet deals as we can, and I've got one for you. Type helixsleep.com slash Loxton into your URL address bar, or click the link at the top of this video's description, and you can get up to $200 off of your Helix mattress and two free pillows. Huh? I love pillows. They're so soft and squishy, like a slug that sleeps with you. This is a transition to Shellos and Gastrodon. Shellos and Gastrodon are new 
fruity branches, sea slugs, of which there are a wide variety. Being soft-bodied, they are highly susceptible to changes in their environment, which is likely what inspired there being two variants of this Pokemon, east and west, different seas, different ecosystem, different niches to fill. The Pokedex mentions that when it senses danger, it gushes a purple liquid, which is an ability that sea hares have, another nudie branch. And another order of nudie branch they pull a lot from are the Opisthobranchia. I mean, just look at the way they carry themselves. Head held high, just like the Mon. And one last note, the Japanese name for Gastrodon is Tritodon, which contains Torito, Spanish for little bull, which is notable not only because of its bull horns here, but also their third eyes. The Tauros constellation is associated with the opening of the psycho-spiritual third eye in astrology, as Aldebaran, the biggest and brightest star in the constellation, lies right between its eyes and horns. Ew! Gosh! I don't want to look at it! Get it away! No! Fine! Ah, ambipom is ambidextrous, which is when you are not left or right-handed, you are equally good with both. The udders... Uh, hands on the ends of its tail are inspired by the many species of monkeys that have prehensile tails, meaning tails with enough strength and flexibility that they can essentially use them like a fifth limb, grabbing branches and swinging from vines. Some say it's inspired by the Ahuizotl from Aztec mythology, but it's a dog. Like, it's got a hand on the end of its tail in more modern depictions, but like, it's, it's a bit loose, just like Ambipom's brainstem. And its stupid flat face is probably from snub-nosed monkeys. Look, we gotta move on, can we please? Thank you. I hate that thing. Drifloom and Drifloom. Both of these Pokémon are based on floating objects, a balloon and a blimp or hot air balloon, and both of their Pokédex entries state that for the most part they are just wandering around, drifting from place to place, wherever the winds take them. Drifloons will sometimes try to take children along with them to the underworld, but more often than not they get taken by the children places, just drifting along. These aspects fit with the wandering spirit type of ghost, usually the soul of someone who died unknowingly. Now they aimlessly wander wherever it was that they died, or wherever their spirit happens to float to, just like these Pokémon. And just like a lot of jellyfish, drifting with the currents. The Tentaculata jellyfish in particular is known for its ghostly luminescence, and only having two long feathery tentacles, just like Drifloon. And loads of jellyfish will rise in the ocean when it's warmer out, like hot air balloons. Also, thanks to the popularity of the IT horror franchise, Pennywise the Clown is sort of synonymous with ghostly horror now, and has made balloons another symbol of spooky ghost clowns. The yellow X noses are likely simplifications of the colored nose cones on the front of many blimps. Or maybe the tape you have to put over a kid's mouth when you kidnap them. <gasps> Boy, Veneri and Lopunny got a whole video about why Lopunny is so... That, and why they are the only Pokémon to naturally learn the move Frustration. They are lop-eared bunnies first and foremost. Buneary can curl them up to resemble earmuffs, which can be made out of rabbit fur. As a lop honey though, yeah that's a playboy bunny, which are still popular in Japan to this day. Almost naked supermodels wearing nothing but a fur cuffed coat was a big trope a few decades ago, which is also back when playboy bunnies were still a big thing in the west, and rabbits as sex symbols has been common throughout most of recorded history, so it's no wonder that this connection was made. More details in the other video. Miss Magius is a witch. I mean, clearly. Raggedy cloak, big pointy witch's hat. Look at the Hex Maniac sprite from Gen 3. They turned her into a Pokemon in the next games. Notably, there is a notable yokai for Miss Magius, the Nasu Baba, a witch with purple skin. Banshees are also worth mentioning here too. Female spirits who are often depicted with incredibly ragged cloaks and often no lower body. They fly around and scream, often a curse of death or a warning of the death of a family member. Ms. Magius's Pokedex entries do mention its cries sound like incantations to torment the foe. It appears as if from nowhere, muttering incantations, placing curses, and giving people terrifying visions. Perhaps visions of their loved ones passing. Honch Crow is the big head honcho that runs the mafia of Murkros. See? It's a crime boss, like Al Capone. He's in a big suit to hide weapons in, and his wide-brimmed fedora. It's body is overall more raven-like now, bigger and stronger, but the white on it probably comes from hooded crows. It got white, you see, and that strange poof on its tail, that's carried over from its witch broom days as a murkrow. It's an old-timey besom broom, capiche? Glamia is a house cat, and it's so fabulous, glamorous, it loves its beauty, a common personality type with cats, always cleaning themselves, and this one even has pink eyeshadow and a lovely pop collar, it's snooty, and its elongated tail resembles springy cat toys. Now, Paragli, though, oh, 
beauty is gone with age. She resembles the trope of a large older woman still chasing after her youthful beauty. Her springtail now acts as a corset in an attempt to look fit and intimidating again, and the eyeshadow and the ears resembling overdone put up hair and cheeks resembling overdone contouring. Oh, that still won't make up for the fact that it's old and wrinkly, hence the triangles and whiskers. And it especially doesn't make up for the fact it has an ugly personality, like plenty of old grumpy cats. Chingling! It's very simple. It's a suzu bell, which are found at Shinto shrines, which can be big with a thick rope that you pull to awaken the nearby kami before you pray to them, or the bells can be small and on the end of a kagura suzu, an instrument used by shrine maidens. As a baby Pokemon, its baby-like trait is that it cries constantly. Its cries sound like bells. Stunky and Skuntank are clearly skunks, likely hog-nosed skunks, which are known for shooting foul-smelling juice out of their butts. However, that's a bit too crude for Pokemon, so Skuntank shoots it forward out of the tip of its tail, like a tank. Its up and forward facing tail also resembles a mohawk or a pompadour, both hairstyles associated with punks and delinquents. They each also have a bit of a cat face, as skunk faces tend to be much more pointed, and this connection may be because baby skunks are also called kittens. Or maybe the face looking like a cat is just a side effect of them making its face cheeks resemble butt cheeks. But like really though, its cry has a fart sound effect? The butt face is probably intentional. Bronzor and Bronzong are a bronze mirror and bronze bell. They come from an old Japanese myth about a village where the priests wanted to forge a bell for their temple and asked the villagers for bronze items to melt down. One woman donated her mirror, but later regretted it, and that spiritual connection led to the mirror being completely unable to melt, which is referenced by Bronzong's heatproof ability. Bronzong resembles a dotaku specifically, which rang in ritual to bring about good harvests, which is referenced in Bronzong's Pokedex entries. And similarly, while it may be a coincidence, Bronzong's face resembles some depictions of Tlaloc, the Aztec god of rain and earthly fertility. So, harvest, basically. Bonsai! What's so sly about it? Well, it's a bonsai tree, but it's a fake bonsai tree in a little pot with legs. It even has a drainage hole in its bottom like clay pots. As a baby Pokemon, its baby traits are... It's drain hole. And also, it adjusts its own moisture level by leaking water from its eyes. They resemble tears. Mime Junior! It's a baby Mr. Mime! And as such, it does mime tricks, even though it looks more like a clown with its court jester fool's cap, red clown nose, and little clown frills. Uh, it's also kind of like a small gnome, who also wear hats like that. One could even say it looks like two scoops of strawberry ice cream with a whipped cream topping and some cherries on top. Its legs are pointy, like a cone, and clowns actually have have an intertwined history with commercialized ice cream cones, it turns out, being the mascot of the biggest ice cream cone manufacturer in the world, who also typically features two scoops of strawberry ice cream on its packaging. Mime Jr. is also a baby Pokemon, and as such, it acts like a little toddler. The Pokedex says, it mimics the expressions and motions of those it sees to understand the feelings of others, which is perfect. Toddlers learn a lot by doing just that, mimicking their parents and older siblings. It's the same idea with Happiny, a baby Chansey. Its Pokedex says, it carefully carries a round white rock that it thinks is an egg. It carries an egg-shaped rock in imitation of Chansey. It's just like little girls playing with baby dolls. The whole Chansey line is essentially Motherhood the Pokemon, and here we see it gets an early start. And like Badoo, it also has that vertical baby hairstyle. And its big pants can resemble both a diaper and an egg cup. Jetpack. It's a parrot with a musical note head and metronome stick tail. Its colors don't perfectly line up with any one parrot, as it appears to be a mix of the blue and yellow macaw and the yellow-colored lovebird, which is indeed a small species of parrot. Chadot's signature move is Chatter, the whole gimmick of which is that you record yourself saying anything and Chadot will mimic it, an ability that parrots are famous for. Spiritomb, the forbidden Pokemon. According to its Pokedex, it's a Pokemon that was formed by 108 spirits. It was bound to a fissure in an odd keystone as punishment for misdeeds 500 years ago. The idea of souls or spirits being bound to a particular item is found in cultures all over the world, but the number of spirits here is important. It points us directly to the Water Margin, a piece of classic Chinese literature. In it, there's a stone monument that similarly is sealing away 108 demons, souls of sinners. But they repent of their sins and become 108 
bright stars of destiny. Spiritomb's face seems to be resembling generic spooky ghost face. You know, think of jack-o'-lanterns. And the orbs spinning around and its ghostly flame-like body could be references to will-o'-wisps, souls of ghostly flame. But also, being orbs specifically may point to Buddhist prayer beads, as the number 108 is also important in a Buddhist tradition. They would perform a yapa with a set of 108 prayer beads in order to destroy one's sins and or reach nirvana. Another Buddhist tradition involves ringing a bell 108 times on New Year's to help in this endeavor. Destroying one's sins, repenting from them, like those 108 demons bound to the stone. Gibble! It's the land shark Pokemon, and it evolves into Gabite and then Garchomp. So, land sharks are a much more recent fantasy creature. Be them sharks with legs, or sharks that magically swim through sand. Creatures like the Boulette from Dungeons & Dragons, or shark-human hybrids from Street Sharks, TMNT, or DC Comics. The little... footballs that they have on the sides of their heads can both reference the heads of hammerhead sharks, as well as the jet engines on fighter jets. Garchomp's Pokedex mentions that when it folds up its body and extends its wings, it looks like a jet plane. It flies at sonic speed. Sharks are known for swimming very quickly through the water with tooth-like scales along their body to reduce drag, just like these Pokémon. Another Pokédex entry says, There is a long-held belief that medicine made from its scales will heal even an incurable illness, which is likely a reference to shark fin soup. And then other Pokédex entries mention that they live in caves, like shiny things, and then hoard those things in its caves. This is where the dragon type really shines through, as this is a common trait that Western dragons are said to have dragon hordes in their dragon layers, it's said to dig them up, which is likely a reference to Gen 4's underground tunnel system with its digging minigames. And lastly, it has a pretty clear connection to Sharpedo, which is a bit complicated, so we have a full video about that linked right here. Check it out! Meanwhile, we're moving on to... Munchlax, a baby Pokémon that evolves into Snorlax. Its baby trait is that it's always hungry. Babies do seem to eat a lot for their size, and that's just because they are so busy growing and developing. And look, it's even got a little bib! Munch and Snorlax are based loosely on bears, or rather the idea of bears. They eat and eat and eat and get really fat so that they can snooze and hibernate all winter. Plus, bears do have an association with honey. They devour it because it's so sugar and calorie rich, and as such, Munchlax is found in honey slathered trees. Also, it's always looked like a burglar to me, like the kinds with the hat and mask covering half of their face. That might be intentional, as they are known to steal food. Riolu and Lucario, part jackal, part African golden wolf, especially when shiny. Being such an upright standing jackal makes the connection to Anubis, a very popular Egyptian god, an easy one to make. Fun fact! Anubis's head is that of the golden wolf, which used to be called a jackal, hence the Anubis is a jackal connections, but more recent archaeology and taxonomy says otherwise. But either way, Anubis is a god of death, and looks at the hearts and souls of the deceased to judge them, which could be a source of inspirations to Lucario's aura-seeing abilities. These abilities are also a part of Riolu's baby traits as a baby Pokémon. According to the Pokédex, it can discern the physical and emotional states of people, Pokémon, and other natural things from the shape of their aura waves. It has the peculiar power of being able to see emotions, such as joy and rage, in the form of waves. Multiple studies have shown that babies are especially adept at picking up expressions and body language, sometimes even better than adults. It's in Instinctual. How cool. And notably, when Lucario senses aura in this way, its dreads float up like this. This, along with its face stripes, resembles a metal Buddhist warrior monk tool known as a kakara, said by some to resonate with spirits, or are used as staves to cast spells with, perhaps like Lucario's aura sphere. This use of them is mostly found in fiction, but either way, when doing so, the rings float up, similarly to Lucario's dreads. The metal rings on its shoulders could be seen as the iron rings some martial artists wear on their arms as weights, and similarly, in some media, have magic powers. And speaking of martial arts, Lucario's fighting type and its connection with Egypt could refer to Egyptian boxing, the earliest recorded combat for sport. Hippopotas and Hippowdon are first and foremost hippopotamus, but they hate the water. Instead, it lives in dry places and covers itself in sand to protect against germs. It's similar to real hippos and sun protection with muddy water. These Pokémon have spouts all over their bodies that expel sand. Sort of like a sand blaster. Take a look at these sand blasters. It looks just like their big nostrils. I love Hippopotas Desert Army camo. And also worth mentioning is the mythical creature the Behemoth, which is said to have the head of a hippo and sometimes is 
depicted as just a giant hippo, but not just any hippo, a sand hippo that lives deep in the desert. So perfect! Scorupi and Drapion are scorpions, perhaps even the Thelephonida, which technically isn't a scorpion, but is similar enough. And strangely, while not water type, they are in the Water 3 egg group, which could be a reference to many aquatic arthropods, like lobsters, or Eurypterids, scorpion ancestors, which are more colloquially known as sea scorpions. Drapion's face is really off-putting. Perhaps its category as the ogre scorpion Pokemon truly is fitting. Its Pokedex entries talk about its violent, raw strength. And ogre do come in many colors, purple included. And I suppose these white things coming out of Drapion's mouth could both refer to large, sticking out ogre teeth, as well as the strange mandibles on the sides of scorpion mouths. Now, maybe you've heard that even just touching a poison dart frog is enough to kill you. Well, with Krogunk and Toxicroak, now they are the ones touching you with their little poison fingy. I'm gonna give you the finger, Croak. Now, it's a small difference, most easily noticeable in the original sprites, but female Krogunks have their white and black midsection higher than the males. This means that this part of their design is likely inspired by the Sharashi, a long cotton cloth that you would wrap around your body under your kimono. Women would wear them much higher than men for breast support. In modern media, Sharashi are usually worn by characters for one of two reasons. It's either to show that they are a person honoring Japanese tradition, or they are tough, strong, and perhaps even a delinquent, which is likely the intent with Krogunk here, hence why it's doing the Bosozoku squat, which is done by Japanese biker gangs who also still wear Sharashi, to both honor tradition and show that they are tough. Now, I do like how Krogunk and Toxicroak have their croaking pouches in different spots. Different frogs have them in different places. And also, also, the spikes that Toxicroak stabs its enemies with are probably inspired by the fighting technique used by the hairy frog, which, in an emergency situation, will break its own toes so that there's a snapped pointed bone that stabs through its skin and it uses that to defend itself. What the heck, nature? Carnivine is pretty straightforward. It's a Venus flytrap. Those carnivorous plants. I do like its Pokedex entries though, saying things like it attracts prey with its sweet smelling saliva, then chomps down. It takes a whole day to eat prey. So basically, it's a Venus flytrap. And and that's it. Finneon is also quite simple. It's a butterfly fish, and its tail fins resemble an actual butterfly. It also is quite the shiny tropical fish, like Neon and Cardinal Tetras, which are some of my favorite fish. Just wanted to bless you with some Loxton lore. Similarly, Luminion's side fins resemble big butterfly wings now, and according According to the Pokedex, it's bioluminescent and uses that ability to attract prey like many deep sea fish, such as the angler or hatchet fish. It also walks along the sea floor like a tripod fish, so it's kind of a hodgepodge of fish, huh? Mantike is also quite simple. It's a baby manta ray. Its baby-like trait is basically that it's just friendly and trusting of everyone, inexperienced and innocent of the cruelties of the world. Its back pattern makes a little smiley face, a nice and cute one, like on a baby bath toy, snover, and a Obama Snow. Well, the name kind of gives that one away. It's based on the abominable snowman, a yeti, a folklore creature said to live in the Himalayas, but also they are generic pine or evergreen trees that are covered in snow, which is typical since they tend to live in colder climates. In Japan, when it snows a lot and these trees get completely covered in snow, they are called juhyo, or snow monsters. So here's a snow monster, a snowy yeti. Yeti is a classic monster. Revile is a civet, or weasel, which are found all over the world, even in colder climates. But it's not just any weasel, it's a kamaitachi, a weasel yokai with huge, sickle-like claws. With its speed, it invisibly runs with the wind and causes mysterious cuts on those in the cold. It's an explanation for wind burn and wind cuts. It also now has a rather interesting head and neck piece, which is why I bring up civets. They've got this big dorsal crest that may have inspired the feather-like headdress that Weavile has. I see many attribute this headdress and gem and eyeliner being Egyptian-inspired. Many Egyptian deities wear similar things, and I can see that. Civets and weasels are found in Egypt too, but they are also found in the Americas, where there are similar jeweled feather headdresses worn by chieftains and Aztec deities alike. So I think instead of referencing any particular one, it's more so a broad signifier of power. Fitting. 
as weasels are also all over the world. Magnazone! Well, that's a UFO if I've ever seen one. A classic flying saucer. Zone is also one of those words associated with your typical pop culture aliens, little green men and all. It's also a more fused magneton, who is three magnemites stuck together. Now they've completely fused due to even more magnetism. The third and now big magnemite has its big red eye in the middle, and its screw became an antenna. It may have gone through a process of electromagnetic forming when brought to an area with an especially powerful magnetic field, which is how you evolve it originally. Long story short, electromagnetic forming is when you pulse high intensity magnetic fields into an electrically conductive metal to make it compress into a new shape. And oh gross, it's licky licky. Well, Lickitung vaguely resembles an iguanodon with its thumbs, and folks used to think that iguanodon had a big tongue because dinosaur science was new at the time, but it's also based on the Akaname yokai, which similarly has a single claw on each foot and a gargantuan tongue, and they share a similar behavior. They lick dirty things clean. Then there's also the idea of a chameleon or a lungless salamander's tongue. Huge projectile tongues. But then, for Licky Licky specifically, it has a bib and this curl of hair and it's especially round, which immediately brings to mind classical depictions of gluttony. Round, dandy macaroni men with their curls and frills and rounditude. And ew, we just can't get away from it, can we? It's right, Perrier. What a mix mash of ideas. It's got the rhino with a drill for a horn traits from its prefos, and then it adds on a wrecking ball ankylosaurus tail. It's got artillery cannon arms, and then it's wearing the protector item that it evolves with, which I guess is like a bulletproof vest and ear protection that folks wear at shooting ranges since it has the whole like shooting artillery cannon thing. But at the same time, it can also resemble a miner's hard hat and safety vest, especially with its orange color. Either way, it's ugly. Maybe it's supposed to be ugly because it's a demolition worker guy. I'm sorry, that was rude. At least Tangrowth, who I love, is cool. A Tangela that's grown up. It evolves when it levels up after you teach it ancient power, which is likely a reference to how most of the world's land was vine-filled rainforest hundreds of millions of years ago. In those rainforests, there were also loads of swamps, and your typical swamp monster is a beast completely engulfed in algae and vines, which is also similar to the Green Man, a legendary being who represents spring and growth. He's usually shown as a face completely overtaken with plant growth, and often has little curls, just like Tangrowth. And also, while blue isn't really a real vine color, red can be, like his little fingies. I actually really like Electivire too. Other than the Tesla coil horns, it seems to lose the Oni origins that Electabuzz had, and now it appears to be an upright ape of sorts, like a gorilla gigantopithecus sasquatch, but with two electrical line tails and a power socket pattern on its back, perfect for carrying an elekid on, and its eyes and this dot on its forehead resemble other countries' electrical sockets, like India's, which is home to a load of those primates. Magmortar is creepy and I don't want to look at it. Like its Brevo, it's hot magma and it's based on a Karura from Japanese mythology. Fire-breathing bird people with ugly faces, essentially. But now its arms are mortars and the ends of its lips are detached from its face, which you could say is a stylistic choice, a way to show off the detached jowls of the Karura while still being itself. Uh, well, due to Magmar's bill, a lot of folks like saying it's part duck or booby due to the protrusions on its head. Magmortar kind of loses that and is overall rounder, much more blobular, and its tail is fire now. I guess you could say its tail detached like a lizard's, and along with its rounder body, I guess that points us to the mythical salamander? The very round fire lizards? That would also explain the spiky frills on its back. This design is just a mess. Why are its flames painted on? Togekiss is cute and and pretty. It's like if a dove was also a fairy and an angel. Its Pokedex entries talk about it sharing blessings to those who inspire kindness and peace. And all three of those creatures can be associated with peace. Here's another entry. It will never appear where there is strife. Its sightings have become rare recently. Dang. Its main body is still very round and egg-like, which it gets from its pre-evolutions, and its sex ratio being so dominantly male may also point to angels or maybe even the military, since it looks a bit like a stealth bomber. Speaking of, Yon Mega is military green on purpose. It's an attack helicopter. Its compound eyes even resemble their windows now. The connection is easy to make, as both dragonflies and helicopters are able to remain stationary while flying, and because of its name and the fact that it's bigger than most 
people. It may pull specifically from the Meganeura, an ancient species of gigantic dragonfly. And lastly, it's known in the Pokedex as the Ogre Darner Pokemon, which refers to Darners, a specific species of dragonfly, as well as ogres, likely due to its size, green color, and sharp sticking out orc teeth. Leafeon and Glaceon, two new evolutions, grass and ice type, both still follow the overall theme that the Eevees follow. They are both generic mammals, kind of like cats, kind of like dogs, kind of like foxes or rabbits too, but as for specific design elements, Leafeon's brown paws resemble dirt. It's like a buried plant, and rather than having leaves sticking out of it, they fade into it, as they have mutated to become one and the same. Also, Leafeon's hair on its head makes it look like a hairstyle commonly associated with generic fantasy elves or even smurfs and trolls, especially of the wood and connected with nature variety. And then Glaceon is wearing warm little knee socks and has a tail that ends like a scarf, and its hat is a warm ushanka or a scarf hat. It's all to keep warm, even though its body itself is icy. Uh, the diamonds all over its design resemble ice crystals. Glisser, or Gliscor, whichever I say people hate me. It's a scorpion fly, which isn't as terrible as it sounds. Oh no, it's much worse. But it also may pull from the Amikiti, a yokai that flies around with its claw hands. But based on Gliscor's ears, fangs, and creepy bat wings, it may also have a gargoyle vampire bat origin. Especially given its ground type and that it has a Pokedex entry that mentions that it hangs upside down in caves and on trees. Mamoswine is what happens when a wild boar mixes with a woolly mammoth and puts ski goggles on. And yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, well its shiny color is gross, like the frozen remains of mammoths, so that's neat. Porygon Z. It's a Porygon, which is like an origami bird man-made out of digital code, and then it gets upgraded, and then if you trade it while holding a dubious disc, it starts m, -m messing up and glitching out as a Porygon Z. A Z is just a messed up two, after all. And we've got a whole sorta two-part video about this guy for more details. It's a favorite of mine. Check it out. Gallade is the evolution of a male Curlia with a dawn stone. Contrary to what many people think, Gardevoir is not a female-only Pokemon. It can be either. It's a feminine prince or princess, whereas the Gallade here is a guardian, a gallant knight to the royals, or even is a prince himself, grown up during times of war, and so is trained in military tactics and sword fighting. His head resembles a Roman gladiator or Corinthian slash Greek hoplite helmet, though its weapon of choice seems to be a tonfa, but like a sword tonfa, and it's taking a fencing unguard stance. It's kind of an odd mix of things, but at least they are all themed around gallant warriors. And the whole line have body types similar to Anasama Nino. Japanese paper dolls, which are specifically dressed quite sophisticatedly and are blank faced so that the viewer can use their imagination regarding their expressions and emotions, which ties into the whole line's theme of reading and sharing emotions. At its core, Probopass is a Mawai, the famous statues from Easter Island. Some of these statues have red top knots called Pukau, which were made from volcanic rock, and we see it atop Probopass as well. Looking at Probopass from the top down, you would see that it resembles a compass, each nose pointing in a cardinal direction and the big red one pointing north. Using a nose as a compass not only insinuates the expression to follow one's nose, but also in many species, fish and birds especially, with a magnetoreception sense, meaning that they can feel the Earth's magnetic field, the ethmoid bone plays a major role in being able to sense that. It holds and is surrounded by magnetoreceptor cells, and this is the bone that separates the brain cavity from the nasal cavity. In fact, here's a quote by a scientific journal. Long story short, they got iron oxide in those cells, and sometimes it's hard to tell what's naturally produced there, and what iron oxide from the outside is just stuck up in there from the outside. Just like the iron shavings used in the classic children's toy Wooly Willy, where you would use a magnetic wand to give the man a mustache and beard. Very similar to the iron shavings we see forming around Probopass's nose. Dusk Noir sort of fills the role as Pokemon's Grim Reaper. It's a creepy spirit that that is said to take lost spirits into its pliant body and guide them home.
At the bidding of transmissions from the spirit world, it seals people and Pokémon away. No one knows whether it has a will of its own. Like the Grim Reaper, it is merely a personification of death. No true will of its own. Death is natural and comes to all eventually. Other potential inspirations include the Yamawaro, said to be a Cyclopsian Kappa, which moved into the mountains. Kappa are known to steal and eat souls, and there's also the Chochin Obake, or Paper Lantern Ghost, which somewhat resemble Dusclop's head, and they too are known to surprise people and suck out their souls. Though there are some other spirits worth mispronouncing, I mean mentioning, like the Hindu Kabandha, who gained immortality but was cursed with this appearance, which also includes huge arms and hands, and now has to eat people. There's also the Brazilian Mapinguari, aka Juma, which similarly has a mouth on its gut, one eye on its head, and huge finger claws. And it too eats people, makes them disappear. I guess humanoid torso mouths are a thing to be feared the world over, because monsters with them are found in medieval Europe and feudal China and Japan, and they were usually cannibals that make people disappear. They all got nipple eyes. Just like Dusk Noir. Frost Lass is a female-only ghost, hence the feminine kimono and obi it wears. And like its counterpart evolution, Glalie, it too is wearing an icy mask. She's entirely based on the Yuki Onna from Japanese folklore, essentially a snow ghost woman who appears on blizzardy nights. She freezes those she finds with her icy breath and leaves them as frost-coated corpses, which is similar to how Frost Lass freezes prey by blowing its negative 58 degree breath. It is said to then secretly display its prey. Rotom seems pretty simple at first. It's a little electric ghost, a poltergeist of sorts, able to possess objects, though only electronic ones, like an electric lawnmower, a fan, an oven, a freezer, a phone, a washing machine, a drone, and much, much more. Its main body is shaped like a light bulb with little lightning bolts coming out of it, or it's just Pulse Man's head. If you don't know, Pulse Man is another game designed by Pokemon designer Ken Sugimori. Rotom has the personality of a gremlin, though, at least originally, wreaking havoc and mischief with machines. These days it seems to be more helpful, and the idea of an electric ghost isn't anything new. Electronic magic smoke and the ball lightning phenomenon come to mind. Yuxi, Mesprit, and Azelf make up the Lake Guardians, Sinnoh's legendary trio, and each symbolize a different part of the Trifort. I mean, sorry of human spirit, knowledge, emotion, and willpower. Each also seem to represent the Imperial Regalia of Japan, or the Three Sacred Treasures, which are the Yata no Kagami, a sacred mirror that represents wisdom, the Yasakani no Magatama, which symbolizes kindness, well-meaning, and benevolent emotions, and the Kusanagi no Surugi, a sword that symbolizes valor and bravery. Willpower, in a way. Also, Azelf has a little elf or gnome hat, Mesprit, the sprite or spirit, has the Lucario dreads, which again may come from the Kaka, which resonates with spirits. And Uxi may have a turban of sorts. Historically and stereotypically speaking, the Japanese often associate turbans with wisdom due to gurus and the like, especially Sikhs. Or it could resemble a falouche, headwear worn by French university students before and during most of the 20th century. But not only that, a form of Chinese turban, known as the Fu To, could play a role here or even the Bokjian, worn by many East Asian scholars, and is very similar to the Yujian, which are used when studying Confucianism. Confucius is, after all, widely considered to be one of the most influential teachers in human history. And would you take a look at that hat of his? It's like a small Yuxi head. Dialga and Palkia, the legendary Pokémon of time and space. Each are designed to be distinct from one another, but when looked at from the right angle, you may have a difficult time discerning them, as time and space are quite interlinked. Their roles are inspired by Izanami and Izanagi, Shinto gods said to have created Japan with a spear by first creating a pillar of heaven, which fits perfectly with the Sinnoh myth that states that they created the world from spear pillar out. Dialga specifically has an ancient body resembling a generic dinosaur, like a general sauropod, perhaps a Brachiosaurus or an Amargosaurus with its neck spikes. It has a diamond in its steel chest, perhaps resembling the fact that clocks and timepieces use many metal parts along 
along with quartz crystals to keep track of time. Also, Dialga's glowy bits look like clock hands, and its metal butt fan could be the top of a clock, 10 to 2 o'clock, and its two long spikes from its brow may resemble both a crown, denoting its deity status, as well as a steel tuning fork, as tuning forks were used in the late 1800s to keep track of time. These clocks had to be long and narrow, just like Dialga's head, and also just like Entropy's head, another time-related character from before Pokemon Diamond came out. Hmm. All this metal and its steel typing may also link with time metaphorically, as time, on its own as a concept, is rigid and unyielding. Traits steel is known for in a more literal sense. Then Palkia. While of course similar to a generic European dragon, especially with its wings, it also has an ancient dinosaur look to it. To further show how old it is, it seems to either be a generic thick theropod or something similar to a Plateosaurus, which does link up better with Dialga as they are closely related. It too is a sauropodomorpha, though before they evolved to walk on four legs. Its shoulder pauldrons look like sea urchin skeletons with a pearl in the middle, and its forearms look like the top of a scallop shell. These connections to sea life, along with its water typing, relate to ancient ideas of what space was. The ancient Greeks believed Earth was afloat in an endless ocean, and the ancient Egyptians had Noon, the oldest of the gods, father of even Ra, and the god of the waters of chaos. Boundless, turbulent, infinite water that is the totality of the outside of the ordered cosmos. Basically, they saw the void of space as an ocean. And metaphorically speaking, it is. Up until more recent human advancement, the ocean was nearly endless water, spanning vast, nigh inconceivable distances. And similarly, water has many states and forms, like the physical universe, matter, always switching between states. Also, look at this, Palkia is wearing heels, and I can't unsee that. Ah, uh, well, it's time to follow up that epicness with Heatran. It's Heatran! It's molten earth, like the earth's core, hence its steel typing. The very center of the earth is solid iron and nickel due to how much pressure it's under, and all around it is magma. As a legendary Pokemon, its role is kind of... Vague? Like, it's a lava dome Pokemon. Guardian of a lava dome? Like, its Pokedex entries are just talking about it being hot and living in caves around volcanoes. The heck even is it? I guess many cultures have volcano monsters of sorts, many of which are responsible for why volcanoes are so hot and fiery, like Typhon from Greek mythology. And just to name a few others, there's the Cherufe in Mapuche mythology, there's Ifrits, fire volcano demons in Islam, the Slavic firebird or phoenixes from all over the world are sometimes said to resurrect from a volcanic eruption, and there's of course fiery dragons that live in caves, often volcanoes, and of course there's our tried and true salamander, which are also said to live in volcanic caves, and are able to walk on rough walls just like Heatran with its lizard tail. Uh, though the tail being as short of it is, and it being all bumpy and crevicey as it is, uh, and it kind of having a large jaw and underbelly, it kind of makes me think of a lava toad. Now remember, young toads still have tails, though fire toads aren't really a thing outside of modern fantasy. Like, yeah, here's Peribit, a lava minder, the spitting toad, nitro toads, and those are just video game examples, but they are all more modern things. And maybe Heatran isn't even a young toad. I don't know, but like, what the heck? It's so generic. I guess it's fine for it not to be based on any one particular thing, but still, maybe because it walks on walls and can learn to move bug bite, it's like a beetle? I don't know. Generic lava monster it is. If I ever do a deep dive video about it, I'll plop a link in this video's description. But for now, since I spent almost a whole day on that one, uh, it's time to move on to Regigigas, ruler of the Regis. All of the Regis are golems, living elementals of sorts from mainly Hebrew mythology. After all, they are said to have writing on their heads, and the Regis all have a braille-like pattern for eyes, and there's an ancient braille language in the game. To be a bit more specific, there is the Golem of Prague, who scared people due to its size, so it wound up sealed away. Same as Regigigas, and also same as the Titans in Greek mythology, said to be the original ones, and humongous elemental giants, and then Zeus sealed them all away. Regigigas, being the colossal Pokemon, and one of the biggest, it probably pulls from a colossus more specifically. Colossi are basically giant living statues. And lastly, its inspiration for its role in the world is the Daidarabochi, a gigantic yokai said to easily move mountains and put the 
continents in place. Similarly, Regigigas' first Pokédex entry reads, There is an enduring legend that states this Pokémon towed continents with ropes. Giratina, the third part of the Creation Trio, one of the first Pokémon created by Arceus, the creator deity of Pokémon. Giratina, as an antimatter Pokémon, created chaos and distortion in the universe, and thus wound up cast down and banished to its own world by Arceus, which gives it a similar origin story to fallen angels, like Satan the Devil. And in its origin form, it does have six wings and a long body, like many depictions of Seraphim, a kind of archangel. And its altered form has six legs, six spikes on its wings, and six neck gripper things, 666 being the symbolic number of Nero Caesar in the coded book of Revelation, I mean, the literal number representing Satan in the very literal book of Revelation. Giratina looks pretty demonic and evil coded, honestly. Spiky red and black and all. Its long body and many legs and even these neck things also make it look a bit like a centipede, does it not? Notably, there is a mythical, humongous, dragon-eating centipede demon in Japanese mythology known as the similarly colored Mukade. But also, Garatina is just Batra, the kaiju from Godzilla. I mean, look at this. Loads of Pokemon are mainly inspired by kaijus, even all the way back in Gen 1. And yes, of course we did a whole video about that too. Also, as a trio, the creation trio are all dragon and one other type. It's steel, water, and ghost which together represent the three primary states of matter. Solid, liquid, and gas. Nice. Cresselia and Darkrai. One's a legendary, one's a mythical, but together they are still the lunar duo. And likewise, we have a whole duology of videos all about their origins in significantly more detail. But in super summary, Cresselia resembles many Eastern goddesses with her Hagaromo, especially Chong'e, Chinese goddess of the moon. She's also a swan, the Cygnus constellation. And also in alchemy, the moon represents the feminine powers, which include fertility, passion, resurrection, intuition, and magic in general, which is why supposedly pagan witches are typically women. Many believed, and many still do, that a woman's menstrual cycle is linked with the lunar calendar, hence the blood rituals and such used to please the triple goddess from many neo-pagan religions. Cresselia's head does resemble three crescent moons in one, and the triple goddess is primarily Hecate, a Greek goddess that when depicted, wards off evil spirits and protects against nightmares. And similarly, garlic is the goddess's main herb, and it keeps away vampires. Speaking of vampires, Darkrai, with its blood-soaked things, is a personification of nightmares in general. A ghostly boogeyman. Phobator, a Greco-Roman god who appears in people's dreams as evil, shadow-like humanoids. A mare that visits you in the night, causing a curse known as Hexensomp or Elflock, causing Polish plight, a hair condition that gives you hair just like Darkrai's. Darkrai looks like it's straight out of Bloodborne because it's straight out of the same place and time that inspired it, Europe, in the early 19th century. The time period of horror folklore, the brothers' grim fairy tales, and many, many dark Deeds. And Fiona and Manaphy are sea angels! These cute little fishes! More specifically, perhaps the Cleone, hence the name. They also have elements of the immortal jellyfish. I mean, look at the Manaphy egg, it looks just like it. The immortal jellyfish is capable of essentially resetting its age by reverting back to previous stages of life. One of these stages is called a polyp, and they have the long tendrils on top of their bodies, perhaps like Manaphy and Fiona's long hair-like things. Also, immortal jellyfish have two possible life cycles. Either they become reproductive and lay eggs, like Manaphy, or they can turn away and revert back into a juvenile, perhaps like Fiona. Shaman has a cute hedgehog form, which is literally a hedge hedgehog. How creative like a little chia pet. Uh, but it also has a deviant art form, though they are officially known as the land and sky forms. It has a grossadilla flower on it, which comes from thank you in Spanish. It's a fictional flower, though is somewhat similar to hydrangeas, I suppose, which in the language of flowers also symbolizes gratitude. These flowers on Shaman are capable of absorbing pollution in the air to clean it, which is kind of what all plants do with carbon dioxide, but Shaman's flower does it to a magical magnitude. In in its sky form, its flower becomes a neckerchief, and its body now looks kinda like a small dog, which I guess do often wear neckerchiefs. And the way it flies is reminiscent of magical
purple reindeer. And I suppose its ear wing things can also resemble antlers when up. And the coloration on its legs also matches with magical reindeer. And also the way its legs are positioned resembles ungulates more so than dogs, though it does have little toes. And lastly, Arceus. The Alpha and the Omega. The Pokemon credited with creating all of Sinnoh, Ransai, and the Creation Trio, and the Lake Guardians, and possibly even the entire universe. Though, doing so drained most of its power, so it no longer is that all. Its strange, alien-like appearance is likely wholly on purpose. It's otherworldly. After all, its own myth mentions that there was nothing, and then there was an egg. And from the egg came Arceus, and then the rest of the universe. Which is similar to the world egg concept found in mythologies from all over the world. It is simply the belief that the universe came from an egg. Just to name a few examples, this is the belief of the Egyptians, Greek, Finnish, Polynesian, Chinese, Zoroastrian, and Vedic. As for Arceus' body, the first two creatures that come to mind are the mythical Keelan from China, a dragon unicorn of sorts that's said to protect virtues and appear with the imminent arrival of an illustrious ruler, as well as a llama with its long neck, short tail, fluffy bits, and upright ears. Yeah, silly llama. Tina, eat. Eat the food. Eat the food! It's especially noteworthy because of the Inca's golden llama god, Arcachile, who watches over animals, which seems pretty perfect for the god of Pokémon. As for its role, it's similar to Kuni no Tokotachi, one of the original gods in Shinto belief, and the one who told Izanami and Izanagi, who are Palkia and Dialga, remember, to create the world from the heavenly pillar out using a spear. There is also the Bodhisattva Avalokitesvara in Buddhism, who is often depicted as white and gold, and is said to have 1,000 arms. Noteworthy because according to Arceus Pokedex, it is described in mythology as the Pokemon that shaped the universe with its 1,000 arms. Avalotketsvara is also credited with creating a lake, and from said lake came Tara, a meditation deity of liberation, the virtues of success and compassion, among other things, elements of the human spirit. Which is perfect because again, Arceus created the lake guardians who represent the human spirit. Also in Buddhism, but also Jainism and Hinduism, there is the Wheel of Dharma, which is used in these religions to represent the Buddha's teachings and moral code as a whole, and it can be said that the symbol around Arceus is inspired by it. But Arceus may pull from Western religion too. For instance, here's the Kapsiel, a symbol from Jewish, Christian, and Islamic mystic amulets found in the 15th century, meaning God is my cover, and belonging to an angel of Saturn. Which is noteworthy because in alchemy, Saturn is the planet of lead, the original metal, the beginning, the base metal that all else emanates from. But this is not the only symbol related to Arceus. There's also the symbol it creates other Pokemon on top of from. This symbol represents it and the creation trio, and it may or may not pull from the shield of the Holy Trinity. But if it was, it wouldn't be out of line. Arceus' symbol may even pull from the Kabbalah of Jewish mysticism, which explains how God interacts with the universe. It was very popular with medieval alchemists, as it helped scientifically quantify God and the astral planet. And right here is what's known as the Path of Saturn. Oh hey, Saturn again! The planet with the rings! It connects Malkuth and Yasad, and it forms the Arceus, the lowest part of the astral plane. Basically, the border between heaven and earth where matter begins to transmute into spiritual energy. Oh yeah, and it's called the Arceus, which is pretty close to Arceus, don't you think? I could go on and on and on about this and that, but I won't. I think that about covers it for now. Arceus is a conglomeration of creative deities and magic belief systems from all around the world, which is pretty stinking fantastic. I'm currently working on my big all everything Arceus video, but I'm definitely waiting until after Pokemon Legends Arceus comes out to even think about putting it together into a proper script. So uh, there you have it, the basics of the origins of every Gen 4 Pokemon explained. Obviously, I glossed over some stuff, and likely missed a bunch too, because there's just so much! And that's what makes Pokémon so cool to me. Let me know what you'd like to add down below in the comments! Please consider supporting our content on Patreon, and until next time, never stop using your noggin.